to the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter. May I direct your attention to the 15th verse. Brother Nathaniel, Exodus chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4. Brother Jesse, Isaiah chapter number 49, verse number 1. Brother Nathaniel, Exodus chapter number 2 and verses 1 through 4. Would you read those, Brother Nathaniel? And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him. She took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, has anybody ever walked up to a new mother and beheld her freshly born infant, thought it was the ugliest thing you've ever seen, but she thought it was a goodly child? Anybody ever done that? You know, sometimes infants can be as ugly as sin. Our brother Jesse says his firstborn son was an ugly baby. You look at brother Micah though right now, he's a handsome young man. Of course, Papa disagrees with him. Micah's always been a goodly child. And I'm sure Micah's mother, who's holding him, would say the same thing. And every mother feels like their child is a goodly child. Amen. All right, Brother Jesse, read Isaiah chapter number 49 and verse number 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Amen. The Lord hath called me from the womb. How many of you feel like you were born to serve the Lord? Born to serve the Lord. Let's look at Isaiah chapter number 49 and verse number 15. May we stand for the reading of our golden text, our primary text this morning. Isaiah chapter number 49 and verse number 15. The Bible says, Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Thy walls are continually before me. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and we praise you for this wonderful opportunity we have this morning to be in the house of the Lord. God, undoubtedly our spirits have been touched by the Spirit of God, the good Holy Ghost. I pray that you would anoint this thy servant, set a guard at my mouth, help me to say only the things you would have me to say, nothing more or less, anoint the ears of this thy people, help them to hear what the Spirit saith unto the church this day through the word of God. Lord, it's not by our mind nor by power, but by thy spirit. We thank you for your spirit that we feel. We pray that you would allow the sayings of this blessed book and this preached word to go down into the heart, going beyond and below the shoulders. Help us not to depart this place sorrowfully, but joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text is found in the Old Testament book of the Bible, namely Isaiah. The title is indicative of its authorship. This book bears the name of its author. And after reading the book of Isaiah, the reader understands that the prophet was doing everything he could to turn his people around. The Jewish people had been a people that were specially selected and chosen by God to be called the children of the Most High God. They were the descendants or the offspring of a man called Abraham and a woman called Sarah. Everything God tried to do for these people comes straight out of a heart that was warm towards these people. No doubt that the same God that beheld humanity and dispatched his only son into this old wicked world to save whomsoever would be saved. No doubt at this time the Lord was doing everything he could to rescue his people from these places that they had become to live in. We know that the Jewish people at this time, they're facing captivity. This man named Isaiah has been born to be a deliverer. His name means salvation. This man was born on a mission. Undoubtedly, this man was born on a mission to save his brothers and sisters. 
We know that the Lord God Almighty gave Cain a brother named Abel. And Cain one time failed his commission. It was his commission to be his brother's keeper. And after smiting his brother unto the death and shedding innocent blood, Cain asked the Lord the question, am I my brother's keeper? No doubt, even though that Cain had somewhat neglected his duty as a brother's keeper, Isaiah is one that has been born with a burden, a baby that has been born on a mission to help rescue his people. How many of you all can sense, especially in this hour, that there is much turmoil in the land? There's much civil unrest. There's much perplexity. There's a lot of people that are troubled on every hand. There's uncertainty. We don't even know what the year 2022 holds for us. We must confess that the year 2021 was better than what we expected. We didn't expect it to go very well, but God was good to us. And we have found that God is a father like no other father. And in our text here this morning, we find that this mother represents God or the nature of God. And I believe that this man Isaiah was a preacher, Brother Jeremiah, that would not rest well day or night until he had delivered the burden of his soul. Isaiah saw that these people weren't in their rightful places. They were not in the hands of God where God desired them to be. And we see that because of this, they sense that they do not have national security. They sense that there's an emptiness and a void in their personal beings. And because of this emptiness and this void, they begin to try to form peace treaties. Just like this world is doing today. This is a world that cries peace and safety. But we know looming on the horizon is sudden destruction. And the imminent danger is upon us. And we need salvation. We need, a, we need a deliverer, not only for our spiritual being and our soul, but we need a deliverer for our nation. We need a deliverer for our nation. This man Isaiah was a man that believed that God could deliver these people from the threat of being taken into captivity. However, the Bible teaches us that because the people would not heed and regard the preached word of God, they were taken into captivity for some time. And there was a remnant that was spared. Now I can't control what my brothers and sisters, earth's inhabitants are doing. But I can control what I'm doing. And I can try to preach to you to help you control what you're doing. And I can see to it that my children are putting their feet in steps that are following the Lord. In steps that are ordered of the Lord. And I feel like it's the will of God this morning that we be in a place called the house of faith. The house of prayer with brothers and sisters for it is in this kind of place that we have seen revivals birthed in our nation. It could be that right here in LaBelle, Florida at the Bethel Holiness Church, 1153 Cornelia Drive, LaBelle, Florida across the street from Fire Forest where prayer is made day and night for our people, for our community, for our government and our leaders without fear or favor, without respect of person. We pray without ceasing for an end time revival. I know that we could be busy trying to become part of the ecumenical church movement. We could become busy trying to help the spirit of Antichrist bring about a peace that is impossible to bring about. And you know, the nation of Israel at this time, they're doing everything they can, Brother Wood, to forge an alliance with Egypt. They're also trying to forge an alliance with Syria. These are pagan Gentile nations, people that want nothing to do with Jehovah God. They want nothing to do with the temples of God. They want nothing to do with the commandments of God. They disregard every spoken mandate of God. Every written precept, they disregard it. But this man, he does what he can to remind his people that they that cover their sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. And he begins to encourage them to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God that they might again be exalted as a nation and as the people of God. And so this man was born on a mission. The Lord had commissioned him, meaning he had been called and chosen for such a time as this. And the calling and the election of this calling is a high calling. The Bible said that he would serve in the stead of a prophet. 
and that he would be a seer, one that could tell future events, one that could see things forthcoming, one that could see things unfold before they began to unfold. This man Isaiah would speak as the very mouthpiece of God. He would speak as the oracle of God. He would look in the future, the future and behold events forthcoming. He would speak of salvation being a possibility. He would speak of redemption being available. He would speak of a remnant that would preserve the heritage of God's people. But more than that, Isaiah the prophet believed that people could have an individual encounter and experience with Jehovah God. And Isaiah believed that for himself, he would serve the Lord regardless of what his nation, family, and other individuals did. And I want to encourage us here this morning, regardless of what this busy world is doing, that we would say like Joshua of old, the great leader and general of the Israelite people, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In the introduction of this message, I have talked about how Isaiah was a baby born on a mission. If you look at the first verse of Isaiah chapter number 49, the Bible says that the Lord hath called me from the womb. This prophet, like Jesus Christ, had been born to serve humanity. Anybody that is familiar with the writings and the lifestyle of Jesus Christ, anybody that has studied his leadership will know that this was a man that was born to be a servant, and that he was a servant leader. In Mark chapter number 10 and verse number 45, John Mark penned the words that the Lord Jesus Christ states his mission on purpose. The Bible said, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for a ransom for many. Do you know why John Mark noted that? Because John Mark noticed that Jesus Christ was willing to die for his children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God himself laid down his life that we might live just like a mother would lay down her life that that child might live. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, I was born to help somebody. That's right, we were born to help somebody and make a difference in another person's life. Grandparents, I would like to challenge you to take a burden and be a blessing to your grandchildren. Grandchildren, I would like for you to take a burden and be a blessing to your grandparents, moms and dads. I would like for you to take a burden, bear your neighbor's burden. I would like for you to enter the prayer closet and pray one for another because truly we are living in perilous times just like Apostle Paul warned us that we would be living in. We look around and we survey the things that are going on, Brother Jesse, and I realize that this is a perilous time for us to be raising children in. I know that I've heard Sister Wooten testify many times in the last 15 years, Brother Jacob, and she has said, I'm so thankful that I've raised my children and that I'm not raising children in this current generation. But you know, I want to encourage the moms and dads this morning that with God, you can raise God-fearing children in the midst of a sin-cursed and perverse generation. I believe that we can help somebody and we can help our families, individuals, and our nations. And that's right, we were born to help somebody. We were all born on a mission to make a difference in somebody's life. Our primary text speaks of a child of the womb. My wife and I have six children, five boys and one girl. They have been children of my wife's womb. Our text says in Isaiah 49 and verse number 15, can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. I would like to answer the great prophet Isaiah in the year 2022. Yes, a woman can forget her nursing child. But I'm so thankful that the Lord speaks concerning God-fearing mothers and godly parents that would not forget their nursing children. In this building today, Sister Howell and I have three daughter-in-laws who have babies under the ages of nine months. 
In our text, we see the heart of a mother and we see the nature of God. In this building, we see the hearts of many mothers and we see the nature of God. In this building this morning, we see the hearts of many ministers and ministries and thus we see the nature of God. This morning in this very service, if you listen carefully, as you're in the womb of this world, and more specifically in the womb of the church, his bride, you can hear the heartbeat of God. You can feel the heartbeat of love. You can feel security. You can feel the power and the presence of God. If you look at verse number 14 before our text, the Bible is speaking of Zion or Jerusalem, the city of peace, the chief city of the Israelis. It says that Zion is speaking perversely, accusing God of forsaking them. Verse number 15, our text lets us know that most, not all mothers are able to not only forsake their children, but to forget them. And I'm so thankful that my Lord promised me that he would never leave me nor forsake me. I know when I've raised them five sons, there's been times that I've sensed the devil pulling for them, Sister Harrison. And, and I realize that if they made one wrong decision, made one bad choice for the Chris, that they would go into a foreign country and, and get a distance between them and God. And, and I always let them know that no matter how far they run, and how far they go, that this father's love would not be any less than the prodigal son's father's love. That my heart would beat for them. Well, one of my sons came to me a couple months ago, and he said, Dad, I'm convinced if I was a drunk laying on one of the shrimp boats of Fort Myers dock there at the port, he said, every night, I'm sure that you would come to the dock and stand there and check on me and make sure that I'm okay. You see, I've tried to demonstrate my unconditional love to my children. And my wife has tried to demonstrate her unconditional love for our children. I want you to notice that this is a nursing child. The Bible said that this child is drawing nutrients from its mother. It's the desire of most mothers to see to it that their children are fed, that they develop, grow, and mature. You see, a mother's desire is to see her child survive, not die. That's God's desire for humanity. God is not willing that any would be deceived. God is not willing that any should perish, but he wants all to come to the knowledge of repentance and live eternally. I know that there's been times that mothers have watched their children err and go aside and leave the doctrines of truth and the ways of Jesus Christ. And they found their sons behind prison bars. And as they approach the place of their children's imprisonment, they look at white knuckles on the other side of them bars. And, and, and Brother Rocap, no doubt those men are remorseful and full of regret that their loving mother would find them in conditions like this. But there's been criminals, serial killers, rapists, thieves, burglars, adulterers, all kind of people that mothers, yes, were disappointed in, but those people never questioned the love of their mother. You see, the mother loved them unconditionally, even though society as a whole hated them. These children were talked about. Their names were blazed upon headlines of newspapers. And people and protesters stood outside of courts and, and demanded that that child be executed but there were mothers that were doing what they could to be beside their children. You see, somehow they knew there was some good in there somewhere. Somehow they knew that there was a child in there somewhere despite the way it looked, despite what had happened. They believed there was some good in their child. They had faith and they believed in them. Are y'all following me right here? You know, the Bible talked to us about some people that were following Christ that appeared to be faithful followers. They were known as the apostles of Jesus Christ. But when hard times came for 
perplexities and difficult situations begin to happen. You know what the Bible said? They begin to distance themselves from Jesus. They put a distance between them and Jesus. And they serve God at a guilty distance. But there was somebody, the Bible said, that was not too far off. Every step of the way in her name was Mary. The Bible said that Mary is standing at the foot of the cross, the place of his execution, crucifixion and death. Even at the time of his burial, she's looking for her little baby. I want you to know that God-fearing mothers never forget their nursing children. And if it's because of God that mothers don't forget their nursing children, it's because of God. And if it's because of God, then we know that God has not forgotten you. That the Lord's hand is not too small and his arm is not too short that he cannot reach one of his children. I know here this morning that I'm preaching a message the Holy Ghost gave me during the night. I tossed and I turned and I heard the heartbeat of God. It's going after somebody. It's reaching for somebody. I said, Holy Ghost, what meaneth this? He said, I want you to preach a message titled The Invisible Umbilical. And I'm preaching here this morning on the heartbeat of God. Not the womb of Mother Nature, but the womb of God. You were born to serve the Lord. You were born to worship God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And maybe there's a distance between you and God. Maybe you don't feel like you measure up for the standard of God's lifestyle for people. But I want you to know God is mindful of each one in this building. You say, well, I've been cussing like a sailor. I said it a little while ago. My son said if I was a sailor and laying drunken on a dock and had been cussing for hours before I passed out, I know my daddy would come to that dock to check on me. And the Holy Ghost has moved on me. And I tossed and turned all night as I heard the heartbeat of God. As we get older, things begin to separate us. And there's a distance, you know, when that child, Brother Dylan, is in the womb of its mother and he hears guttural noises. It hears abdominal noises. It hears life itself. Y'all know what I'm saying. It hears the liver quiver. It hears the kidneys and the bladder function. But most importantly, it hears the heartbeat of that mother. Mother. That baby knows that mother before it ever comes into this world. And once that baby comes in to this world, there's something still attaching it to its mother. It's called the umbilical cord. You see, a newborn's umbilical cord typically falls off within two weeks of birth. What is an umbilical cord? Some of these children are thinking. The umbilical cord is the baby's lifeline to the mother during pregnancy. And once the baby is born, the invisible lifeline is no longer needed. Are y'all getting this right here in this building? You know there's a physical umbilical cord that's apparent. And they pull out the scissors or the shears and they detach that baby from that mother that it might be coming in Entity, that it might become independent, but there's still an invisible lifeline. Even though the physical umbilical cord is detached, there is still an invisible lifeline that wants to provide nutrients and nourishment for that baby, no matter how old it gets. Y'all ready to go home, or do y'all want me to keep preaching? Huh? I was born to help somebody. I was born to serve the Lord. Our brother read to us from Exodus chapter number 2. 
in verse number one through four. And you know what, Brother Nathaniel? I believe it was you that read those scriptures. You talked about a sister to Moses named Miriam that was standing afar off wondering what would happen to Jochebed's baby, her baby brother. You see, the mother of Moses, Jochebed, had Moses' older sister looking out for him as he floated among the reeds in the Nile River. I remember when I was a prodigal son, 25 years ago. No doubt, Brother Jesse, this world has set me down. Of course, there was uncharted territory. You know the Nile River is known to be possessed and literally controlled by something called crocodiles. They rule the river. When they're in a specific location, man or beast does not enter there. But this woman has to put her baby in a bull rush in an ark of bull rushes and lay it up in the reeds in the Nile River. Brother Jeremiah this generation that accepts abortion they would not let the least bit be concerned of this child's well being. But this mother knows that it will be obvious if she sits on the bank and watches this ark of bull rushes and she can't go. But she makes sure uh, that somebody can go. Uh, and church, uh, Jesus Christ himself cannot come uh, in this building this morning. Uh, but God sent me like Miriam uh, to watch over your soul. Uh, the Bible said pray uh, for your pastor and your minister as those uh, that watch over your soul. Uh, I know uh, that the adversary is doing everything uh, he can uh, to consume your innocence, uh, to consume your life. But I want you to know there's somebody looking out for your soul. Oh, I feel a preacher right here. So Miriam doesn't want anything whatsoever to happen to her baby brother. Brother Micah's got a baby brother now. If you look at the second pew over here on my left hand side, you'll see Micah David Howell. And you'll see Malachi Obadiah Howell. Now, I don't know the age difference right now between Miriam and Moses, but obviously Moses' mother could trust her to be kind of an Isaiah, a seer, somebody overlooking things. You ever seen somebody that's about to cross the street and you knew Brother Jeremiah that they had surveyed things properly and there's a vehicle coming, but because somebody's a seer, they can see something coming that they didn't see and they saved them. And that's why I'm so glad I go to church routinely multiple times a week because sometimes the devil, he's got a zeroed in and he's doing everything he can to destroy us. I wonder how many times did the crocodile head towards the cry of that bull rush. Hey, come on. You know what they said? Corral curiosity killed the cat. What about the crocodile? As the baby cried in that ark of safety, in that ark of bull rushes, how many of them 15 feet long crocodiles begin to check the things out. Come on church, you all know we better be careful in this world because the Bible said the devil is seeking who he may devour. It would have been so easy for the jaws of that crocodile to snap the bulrushes and to snap that baby in two. But there was somebody watching over that little baby. And how many of us have been the product of a mother and a father. When I was a prodigal son 25 years ago, I knew somebody had been praying for me that somebody cared for my soul. At a point in David's life, he mistakenly spoke. He said, erroneously, he stated, nobody cared for my son. But you'll find that while he's fleeing the kingdom, Jesse and his mother come looking for their baby boy. He's been king of Israel. He should be able to take care of himself. But I don't know about you, but 
I think it'd been great, Brother Chris, to look over my shoulder and see Brother Jesse and Mama Jesse coming to make sure. You know, Jesse and David's mama liked to send him cheese and breads to the boys as they was fighting in the valley. Y'all remember that? I imagine Mama came with a basket of goodies because it doesn't matter if your child is the drunk on the dock in Fort Myers or if your child is the king of Israel. You can't keep a mother from her baby. And I want to tell each one of us here this morning, no matter what we've done, no matter how far we've run, you can't keep God from Myself. The Bible said, if I make my bed in the belly of hell, thou art with me. Thou art there. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. You see, I believe that this mother was doing what she could to look after Moses. And you know, the Bible said that she raised some great people, some God-fearing people, namely Aaron, the great prophet and priest of the Most High God, the wonderful praise leader, worship leader, singer Miriam. She's a child of Jacobin. But what about Moses, the man of the book, the man of the mandates? Moses, we all know the story of Moses, how he began to cry in the ark of bulrushes. Now, my daughter-in-law has got those babies under the age of three months, knows that about every month their physical appearance changes, their disposition, demeanor changes. They go from being a sweet, quiet, innocent baby that Papa says never cries to their mothers walking into church wild-eyed, hair frayed, and say that baby's been crying all night, all week long. And they wonder what's wrong with the baby and what's wrong with them. Well, the Bible said that Moses' mother, after three months of hiding him in the house, she should have known he was going to be a loud mouth preacher. She couldn't hide him in the house no more. No matter how much she sang Mary had a little lamb. No matter how much she sang Jesus loves me. No matter how much she cradled and tried to conceal. The baby's got to come off the umbilical. And it's got to depend upon the invisible lifeline. And she takes that baby after three months and puts it in the ark of safety. You know what the Bible says? Not by coincidence, but by providence. They planted that baby in the bathtub of Pharaoh's daughter. And she heard the crying of that baby. God's heard your heart cry. God's heard you at night. As you prayed and said, Lord, be a steel. Care about me. Lord, is it possible for us to get back to God? Woo! Uh, so she takes that baby. Are y'all with me right here? Up out of the water. And she names it. Jacobin didn't name it. Pharaoh's daughter named it. Now you tell me God's not in this situation. She names it drawn out. Drawn out. Pulled out of harm's way. I believe that Sister Jacobin was back there in the village of the Hebrews down there in the land of Goshen. And Brother Jesse, I believe she was in there washing some clothes on the washboard. Wow, Moses' father made some brick. And she's got a hold of that invisible lifeline. And at that moment, the Spirit of God is moving upon her. And she's praying and saying, God, pull him out. God, deliver my baby. God does not only deliver the baby, but God sends the most powerful woman. I mean, the queen herself ain't as powerful as this. Everybody knows that a man's daughter is powerful. If there's anybody that can disregard and disobey the mandates of daddy, it's this princess. Huh? She pulls that baby up out of the water and it's a crying and she says, 
I'm going to call it Moses. And so Jochebed disobeyed Pharaoh's orders because Pharaoh had told him to destroy all of the Hebrew babies. All of them infants were to be thrown into the Nile River. You see, just the cry would have incited the crocodile. Just the splash. They were familiar with the sound and the noises. Just the fact that the baby was there. It was imminent danger. It was damnation. It was destruction. Yeah, God knows what we're up against. Yeah, God knows what we're facing. But God's got an ark of safety called the church. And it's built read by read. Person by person. It is a house of safety. So Jochebed disobeyed Pharaoh's order and Pharaoh's daughter disobeyed Pharaoh's order to destroy the Hebrew baby boys. So neither one of them are wanting to destroy this child because it's the heartbeat of a mother. Once they get that baby in their hands, are y'all listening? Moses developed into a fine young man who began to be a great leader. And he had some awesome qualities and skills. Would y'all notice with me that Jochebed had to sever the umbilical cord? Would y'all notice with me that even Pharaoh's daughter had to sever the umbilical cord? She's holding that baby. She's a virgin daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt. She's not a wet nurse. She's unable to provide. Hey, this is people of antiquity. They couldn't go down to the convenience store or to the grocery store and get info meal and nipple. And so here's this crying baby. And she says, I can't do nothing with it. And all of a sudden, Miriam peeks through the shrubs and the bulrushes. And she says, would you like me to go get a mother, just a mother? Just a mother, you know, just a mother. One of them, he it looks like a Hebrew baby. Kind of looks like us. Yeah. Would you like me to go get a mommy for it that can feed it, take care of it until the child is weaned? And Pharaoh's daughter loved the child enough, brother Rocap, to say, yeah, we'll cut the umbilical as much as I love it. I want it to live. I don't sound like them two mothers that were fussing and pot in the courts of Solomon, right? One was the real mother and one was not the mother. One said, go ahead and cut the baby in half. I'm not talking about cutting the baby in half. I'm talking about there comes a time when God cuts the cord to see if we'll stay attached to the invisible lifeline. I'll find a wet nurse, one of them Hebrew women that just happens to be a wet nurse that I would have thought, how in the world can you have a wet nurse when you're supposed to be throwing all the infant boys All them infants, huh? I guess it's supposed to be the mother of an infant girl. But nevertheless, here comes Miriam home. And Jochebed's doing the chores. And she sees a baby in the arms of the Miriam. And Miriam says, Mama, guess who I got? <laughs> I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Mama, guess who I got? I know who you got. I recognize the cry of my baby. Huh? God knows his children. The Bible said that his sheep knows his voice. And another they will not follow. God knows your heart. God knows how close you want to get to God's presence. God knows how bad you miss mama. God knows how bad you miss the nurture nutrients. God knows how bad you miss that heartbeat. God knows how bad you miss them Hebrew songs. She said, let me hold my baby. Let me hold my baby. And, and Miriam said, Mama, Miss Egyptian Pharaoh down there, Princess Pharaoh, she said, his name is Moses. And Miss Jacob said, that won't work for me. His name shall be called Moses. And they've got a permit on the front door of the tent that says this baby is permitted to be here by order of Pharaoh himself. I've got a Holy Ghost in this house. Y'all with me right here? And the midwives are supposed to be tossing all the babies into the Nile River knows there's an untouchable child that is attached to the invisible lifeline of Pharaoh. 
the king of the land. And church, the devil knows that you're the child of God and you're attached to the invisible love God of God Almighty. Church, we were born under the Lord of God Almighty and how blessed it is to be called a child of God. And you know what? As Moses got older, Jochebed had to release him to go back to Pharaoh's house. Because the princess had forgot the one she loved. Are y'all getting this? I mean, this is a loved baby. This baby is loved and both mothers are having to separate from it so it'll survive. And God has to be detached from us physically. I wish God was here this morning. I really do. And I wish he was doing the preaching and I'm trying to let him preach through me. But Brother Jesse, if he was here this morning, there's one thing we would all walk out this building saying. God was here and we felt his love and I feel like we feel the love of God right here in this building. And you know, Jacob had one time was revisited by the Egyptian princess that sent Moses to live in the house of Pharaoh's daughter. But we got to move on here for the sake of time. It's taco time. But, but you know, there come a time that Moses got to looking at his skin tone. The Bible said he'd walk out there to that little village and look at his people. And he realized and figured out those are my people, not the Egyptian people. So I think one day maybe Miss Pharaoh Egyptian daughter got on to Moses. And Moses spun on his heels and with a smart aleck comment he said, you ain't my mama. You are my biological mama. And I remember 25 years ago, Sister Hal, when I changed mamas. I remember 25 years ago when I finally told the devil, I'm tired of sucking on a sewage pipe of sin. And I'm ready to get back to touch to my mama, my daddy. Come on. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I don't want to ever be detached or severed from this umbilical cord called the invisible lifeline. I thank God for every time the Holy Ghost moves. I thank God for every time I feel the Spirit of God. I just cannot get enough of it. You know God wants his best for all of his children. There's not one of us has to stand at the end of the line. We're all front of the line children. Amen. So Pharaoh's daughter named him. Now I don't know what my new name in glory is. But right now they know me as Reverend Jeremy David Howell, that crazy preacher in the bell. But I don't know what my name might be over there. Huh? Are y'all listening? There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, thank God it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I'm not talking about only the name Jeremy Howell being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm talking about on the other side of that leaflet what my real name is, what my spiritual name is, what my heavenly name is. Are you all with me right here? I know we're all going to be children of Moses, so to speak. We're going to be those people that have been drawn out of this wicked world and have escaped the damnation and the judgment that is the cup. So we can get out of here and go eat chicken. I'm not going to hold you long. I'm going to cut it short. And I'll preach some more tonight at 6 p.m. But Brother Jesse, there's no greater joy than to hear your son scream out like he just did. And he's going to be a talker, Brother Chris, because that little guy does not show up. And I asked last night, I said, well, he didn't get it from Daddy Jesse, even though he looks like him. And he certainly didn't get it from his mother. And Sister Wooten, the only one I could cast the blame on is his Uncle Philip. <laughs> Mr. Motormouth himself. 
Somehow that come down through that howl gene somewhere, Sister Hannah. But that's a beautiful sound, isn't it? And don't you know it's wonderful when God's children come back to the Father's house? There's not a whole lot said about the prodigal son's mother. But I think she was so happy. The father's out there at the gate welcoming the son home. But mama's in there putting knuckle prints in the biscuits. I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, I feel the sweet spirit of God. Because when he came to his senses, when he realized he was reconnected to the invisible lifeline, you know what the Bible said was on his mind? The Bible said there's bread enough and despair that I perish with hunger. He said not only can I get bills and beans in mama's house, but there's bread enough and despair. At Mama's house, there's coconut cream pie. Woo. We're getting spiritual right here, right now. At Mama's house, there's pumpkin cheesecake. At the Father's house, right here this morning, right here this morning, has anybody felt any nutrients come through the invisible lifetime? I remember, Brother Roquet, when I was lost and undone without God and the Son, and there was an emptiness and a void in the pit of my stomach. And I remember when I was dissatisfied with everything this world had. But once I got hooked back to the invisible lifeline, if I cried, the Lord was there. The Bible said, one of the psalmists pinned the lyrics, he said, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all of his troubles. I'm going to say that again. One of the psalmists pinned the lyrics, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all of his troubles. When I cry, the Lord hears. Hey, come on, church. My God is my believer. New Year's Eve night Let's stand here So I can get you to the chicken house And you say So you can't say I preach too long Amen Amen New Year's Eve At 11.55 I had been in bed for about an hour and a half And I had been sleeping Just kind of letting down I've got old enough now, it didn't matter if I saw the new year coming or not. I prayed it in before I went to sleep, amen. And uh, I, I just really wasn't planning on doing anything other than sleeping it in, amen. And, and about 11.55, I come to like this. And, and I felt led and pressed the Lord to look at my phone, and it lit up. And I'm telling it right, Brother Jesse. It was a text from Brother Jesse. And he works for the Immokalee Water and Sewer District. And he hadn't had a call all week long. He's on call. And down in there, that's a rough area. There's a lot of drinking, a lot of Haitians, a lot of Hispanics. just a lot of partying. And at that moment, I felt like I needed to go with him. I've never been with him. I think that's the only time I've been since, right? And I, I, I told him, I said, hey, you want me to go with you? He was just texting me the address, so if something happened to him, I'd know where to go. I said, you want me to go with you? And my sister house, she rolled over. And she looked like only I've ever seen her. Amen. <laughs> and she said, who is that? And I said, it's Jesse. He's going down there to Mockley. She said, it's bad down there. I feel like you should go with him. I said, honey, I feel the same way this time. I just feel like I should go with him. And so I rushed over there to his house and rode down there with him. And when we pulled up, it's one of the biggest parties I've ever seen, Brother Jesse, disregarding all the rules, crazy stuff going on. It looked like a morning fog. There were so many firecrackers. They almost, I mean, they had to almost set our vehicle on fire. They're just crazy, nuts. He's trying to fix the backflow, do some plumbing, Brother E.J. Wallace, and I look, I couldn't believe it. Six or seven drunks were standing there by him. Just watching him. They're offering him tacos and beer. 
I don't know how many beers he was offered. But his daddy's a holiness preacher, and I watched my son being offered alcohol. You follow me? Then they're asking him to come in. They're cheering. Yeah, the water man's here. We're going to get water. They're cheering. But there were some crazy things that took place in that 45 minutes. I just sat in the truck and watched. And I said, God, I don't really know the mind of the Spirit and how you do what you do, but because I was his daddy and she was his mama, at the very second he texted our house, there, there's just some kind of connection there. Y'all get that? It's more than intuition. Mothers, you know what I'm talking about? Children, you receive them text messages from dad or mom and you wonder, how did they know? How did that preacher know what I've been dealing with or, or what I've been facing or how I've been feeling? Because you've got a connection with God. They've got a connection with God. There's an umbilical there. There's a lifeline. It's invisible. You can't see it, but God's working for your survival. The messages are preached that we might not be destroyed. Those messages are preached that we might not go to hell. Those messages are preached. You follow? God was letting Sister How I know that our child potentially could be in danger. And here this morning, I want to tell somebody something. I remember when my firstborn son, Jeremiah, was born. He was born through Caesarean section. C-section, they call it. Emergency C-section. And as they ripped the womb of my wife open as fast as they could, really with no respect to her body, you've been there, Brother Samuel. It's an emergency. They wanted to save that child, Sister Wood, and take care of that mommy. But do you know when that son of mine come out of that womb, I wish he was here, he took the bus children home a little while ago. He'd like to hear this. When he came out of that one, and I heard a half a second of a cry, I lost my breath. My physical breath left my body as I had an awareness of my responsibility as a father and as God connected me to that invisible lifeline. And again, I wish he was here this morning, but about five years ago, he was working, and he was working with a mechanical, hydraulic-powered, electrical, also diverter gate. On that, they have a lever or an arm, and that gate had become locked and jammed. And Brother Jeremiah, the plant manager he worked for then, was trying to dislodge it. It was a hen thorn precast. And Brother Nathaniel, one of the main men, forgot to... Turned the power off. And while my son was trying to get that arm to free up, dislodge, somebody hit the button on that gate and it slammed like that. Hit him in the head. At that very same moment, I had got out of bed telling that story, Brother Jeremiah, about how God brought you back from the dead. A lifeline. All you remember was being hit. You don't remember anything else. What side of the head was it? Right there on the temple with a blow harder than Muhammad Ali could throw. He's out. Gone. Motionless. Appears to be lifeless. The staff and faculty, they panic. They, they're so concerned and worried, they don't even call 911. He's laying there, brother, for a couple minutes before they can collect their thoughts. You see, they weren't attached to that invisible lifeline. And his life's leaving his body. But over there, the 3180 Fussell Grade Road, there's a daddy. About 6.45, rolls out of bed. Starts weeping and crying in the spirit. And as I'm crying in the spirit, I say, God, spare my boy, Jeremiah. 
God spare my boy Jeremiah. God keep him alive. God let him live. And I cry and I weep. And I cry, Brother Je Samuel. And I sob and I weep and I pray. Come to the piano, Brother Jesse. And you know what, Brother Brocap? About 30 minutes later, we heard from his boss men and said, Your son needs to go to the doctor and get that checked out. We took him to the doctor. And Brother Jeremiah, they said, There ain't no damage. There's no damage. Now, I know if you talk to him, you beg to differ. But there's severe brain damage. Now, this old boy's a sharp one. He's smart. So now he's the plant manager. That's how smart he is. Does anybody feel the love of God here this morning? Oh, I feel the love of God in this Well, preacher, you don't know how far I've gone. You don't know how bad I'm wounded. Listen, you can be wounded fatally. And there's nothing too hard for God to revive. There's nothing too hard for God to pick up. There's nobody too dirty for God to clean up. Well, preacher, you have no idea. If there's a homosexual in the building, that's not a case too difficult for Jesus. Are y'all listening? If there's somebody full of bitterness and hatred, there's not a case in this building too difficult for the Lord to take up and win. I wonder if we could bow our heads this morning. Moses was crying in the bull rush of safety. But there was a visible lifeline. Brother Jesse sings. Is there somebody in this building this morning say, Preacher? There's nothing in the world better than being attached to this invisible lifeline. Would you raise your hand and say, I want to make sure I'm attached? There's one hand, two hands, three hands, four hands, five hands, six hands, seven hands, eight hands. I'd like to ask everybody in the building, if you would, to come to the front and let's pray. The Spirit of God is moving. Tears are flowing down faces. Hearts are broken. God's a helping us right here. There's nothing in the world like being attached to this lifeline. I thank God for the lifeline. You feel like praying with somebody? Pray with them. I am my brother's keeper. The invisible life of You need a friend. You find life with grace. The same. I promise you I'll always be when your heart is full of sorrow and fear, and I'll carry you when you need a friend. You will find love and grace. God has not forgotten. God has not forsaken me. You were there for me yeah. through it all when everyone around said that I would fall. You were my friend to in me Going through the good times 
In the bad at times I felt that you were all I had You were my friend And you believed in me And you went the extra mile Yeah. 